Hi, everybody. I'm Elaine Chang. I'm the director here at TerraWorks for market development and customer success. Um, so to start off today's webinar, uh, we talked to lots of nonprofits that are running complex projects, sometimes multiple complex projects, which means that you're managing different project phases, different tasks depending on those phases, and also tracking impact along the way. There are lots of tools out there that offer ways to do this, but we wanted to highlight for you today how one organization is doing all of this when their operations are in really remote areas that have inconsistent connectivity at best. So, today we're really excited to be joined by Bridges to Prosperity, which works to combat poverty from rural isolation by building footbridges. So from Bridges to Prosperity, we have Abby Noriega, who's the Director of Evaluation. We're also joined by Serena Schultz, who's the Senior Project Manager at Mowgli Technologies. And together, they'll be sharing their journey of building an offline project management system to support the bridge construction projects and to track um, their impact across Latin America and Africa. So before we get started, I want to go over some housekeeping rules. So number one, this session is being recorded and we'll be sending this around to you and everyone else who's registered. Um, and this will also be available on the terraworks.org blog, um, our website. So if you have questions, raise your hand or you can type your question into the Q&A window. I'll be moderating that throughout the session. Um, if you have a clarification question, I'll sort of jump in and get that answer for you. Um, but otherwise, get those questions in and we'll address them at the end. Um, great, I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Abby to discuss what Bridges to Prosperity does. Uh, one second. There you go, Abby. Get that. Thanks so much, Elaine. Hey, everyone. I'm Abby Vega. Um, as Elaine mentioned, I'm the Director of Evaluation here at Bridges to Prosperity. Um, so I manage monitoring and evaluation at our organization and then also systems. Um, so I wanted to walk you through kind of our recent evolution in systems and how we use technology to manage um, pretty complicated construction projects in remote environments. Um, so we tackle rural isolation. Um, and specifically poverty um, caused by rural isolation. And we do that um, by building footbridges over impassable rivers. So this challenge um, is actually pretty, um, not, not very well known, but really significant. We estimate that there's about a billion people facing this challenge throughout the world. And our organization alone has documented thousands of instances um, like you see here. So people who have to risk their safety just to get to schools, to markets, um, to hospitals, to employment opportunities. And we know that aside from the daily um, in, inconvenience and, and the risk to um, life and safety, this is also a root cause of poverty in the developing world, um, where people, their only option to get to uh, critical destinations is uh, to cross uh, at really dangerous crossings like you see here. And so we tackle this problem by building footbridges. Uh, most of the developing world, um, particularly in rural areas, is a walking world. And so we focus on pedestrian infrastructure because it's cost effective um, and we know that it works and it lasts a really long time. And so we have done this, um, actually this slide's just a little out of date just because we are coming off of our heavy construction season. And so to date we've built about 279 bridges um, in 20 countries and collectively they serve um, just over a million people. Our current operations are in six program countries and we have an upcoming needs assessment in Liberia. So we're pretty globally spread. And local investment and local participation is integral to our work. Um, so you can see here these ladies in Haiti are collecting aggregate from the river to go into the bridge foundation. 
We use locally appropriate construction techniques. We're working in very remote environments without the benefit of heavy equipment. We work with local fabricators, masons, engineers. And what this all means is that it contributes pretty significantly to our long-term sustainability and cost effectiveness, um, but it also means that any technologies or systems we develop have to be incredibly flexible and locally adaptable. And so before I jump into um, what our systems look like, I just wanted to give you an overview of what a site selection um, looks like for a particular bridge project. That's a question that comes up a lot. Um, so this is very high level, um, but it starts with identification of a, of a potential bridge site. Um, so that's how we've identified um, thousands of bridge sites um, all over the world where people uh, could use a bridge uh, for a safe crossing. And what this looks like for us in the field is that it's conducted as part of a national needs assessment that we do um, when we go into a new country. And that's um, typically done by a program engineer or trained assessors um, that they are managing in the field. Um, from there, we move on to prospecting, and this is when we're actually looking to build the bridge um, in the upcoming fiscal year. So that usually looks like a technical assessment conducted by a local program engineer, um, and then local government contracts negotiated by our country program manager or other local staff. Um, and then from there, we move on to confirmation. So this is when um, we have a design in place. We know that the, the bridge um, is has both local support and that we've got funding for it um, and then we're able to um, submit that for approval to our global director of operations here at our headquarters in Denver and then we move on to construction from there so that's kind of the background of how we um, select a site and it's really foundational for uh, the, the systems that we've developed to support that process so um, up until about a year ago, uh, that entire process was managed um, with forms like this. <laughs> so um, we've been around for more than 15 years, and for more than 15 years, um, this is what uh, our data collection looked like. Um, you can see some of the dates on these are really recent. Um, we haven't even built some of these bridges. These are so recent. Um, and this actually worked pretty well for us for a really long time. Um, but we are looking to scale as an organization. There are very few organizations that do what we do. Whoops. And so it was really important to us um, to be able to build a system um, that allowed us to collect and manage and aggregate and understand the data that was coming in from the field um, at scale. So you can see that um, really the, the most technologically advanced we were um, up until about a year ago was to take pictures of the, the kind of files um, that you just saw, the kind of field data, upload it into our online file storage system, um, and then our project management system was uh, basically an Excel sheet where we did Gantt charts that were not uh, updated very often. Um, really a, a process that uh, worked on a day-to-day -day basis but was not uh, very effective or efficient um, on a global scale, um, certainly not something that we could uh, scale up if we're looking to grow our operations. So in 2016, we formally launched a monitoring and evaluation program. We had worked with researchers before, um, but did not actually have a formal program in place. And so as part of our monitoring and evaluation, systems were a, a super high priority, um, both for uh, measuring our impact, um, evaluating our operations, and our development programs. And so high priorities included an integrated database and project management system, a mobile data collection system, um, and then real-time uh, reporting and analysis, or as close to real-time as, as you can get when you are, are working in six different countries and multiple time zones. And so priorities for those systems um, included a project database that integrated with our fundraising database and mobile data collection system. Um, our operations and fundraiser are, are actually pretty closely tied together, and so that was key for us. Uh, our project management system, um, so something moving away from that Excel spreadsheet, something that integrated with that project database. 
and then also piloting a community survey program that could ultimately be rolled out to any program country in the world. Um, I am not a programmer and my, my job is pretty broad. And so the requirements for that system um, needed to be user friendly. Um, it needed to be essentially um, out of the box, but also fully customizable. It needed to be applicable across many different geographies um, and of course affordable and scalable. And so we ultimately settled on Salesforce um, and I'm gonna kick it over to Serena here in just a minute to talk to you about what that looks like and, and why Salesforce was um, ultimately what we landed on. Um, but what that looks like um, is that central to our Salesforce system are bridge project records. Um, that's, that's our intervention, that's our, uh, our, our main program activity. And from there, um, you can uh, view and aggregate data from staff and volunteer donor records, um, donation records, we can uh, connect SMS survey data for our community survey program, mobile data collection so that we can aggregate um, all of the data that you saw in those forms, and then also project management. And all of that is centered around the bridge projects in our Salesforce system. And the way that we came to this um, was I, I first started looking at each of these elements individually. Um, how are we going to get data in from the field? How are we going to do a survey program? Um, and it was really in talking um, with uh, Elaine actually at TerraWorks and who ultimately connected me to the folks at Mowgli um, that we started a partnership with Mowgli where they became not just a service provider but also uh, really thought partners um, and helped us um, design an architecture that supported our entire operations. Um, they really took time to learn about what we do as an organization. Um, what our constraints and challenges and kind of hopes and dreams were, and then how to build a system um, that was customizable, but also extremely scalable from there. And so from there, I will pass it over to Serena to talk uh, a little bit more about how um, they take that approach. Great, Serena, I've just switched it over to you, so hopefully you got that. Perfect, okay, hopefully you guys can see my screen. So um, thank you, Abby. I am Serena Schultz and I work with Mobley as a senior project manager. Um, I do want to just talk a little bit about who we are so that you have some background before we head into Bridges. So Mobley was founded in 2011 and we focus on connecting strategy, technology and culture to help organizations do more of what matters like you just heard Abby describing. Uh, we work with organizations all over the globe, and we're a Salesforce partner and also an ISV, which means we have apps on the App Exchange. You might know us as TACT. Um, this summer, we've been undergoing a brand change, which merges our consulting business, previously TACT, with our mobile app, Mobley, Mobley SMS. And so we're now known as Mobley Technologies. We have an in-house team, which is pretty nimble and is also based out of Colorado, but we have experts across the field um, and across the country that work with us to support our clients. So we're really lucky in that respect. All right, so back to um, Bridges to Prosperity. So at, you're gonna see this slide a couple of times because I think it's a really great representation, but of the hundred some clients that we've worked with, Bridges to Prosperity is one of the most advanced user of, users of Salesforce in terms of using it to run their entire business. Um, as Abby laid out, they have a really complex operation and it spans multiple departments and many countries. And they use Salesforce and their suite of apps and tools to keep all their data and tasks from being dropped, to allow for granular visibility into projects and to do all that from anywhere on the planet. So everything from identifying a village as a potential bridge site to coordinating volunteers to tracking the donations, it's all managed through Salesforce. Um, so we're gonna talk a bit about the apps that do that. Uh, Taskray is used for operations and project management. Mowgli SMS helps bridges to communicate with the bridge communities and TerraWorks is used by the local field staff um, in those low connection and offline areas. But what's really the most important is that all of these apps are working together to help bridges to gather and work from a consistent data model that in turn drives their feedback loops and helps them with that evaluation Abby was talking about. So there are a lot of apps in play here and <laughs> you might be already thinking, you know, why didn't you just build this custom? Like, why do you have to use all these apps? And how do you even know what apps to use? And doesn't that get really expensive? So let's talk just a little bit about apps versus custom code. Um, 
the first point that I'll touch on is that Salesforce is a tremendous tool and it is always evolving um, and it's always uh, actually coming out with new features. Um, and so they actually roll out new features and fixes every four months, which means it's changing all of the time. Your organization's needs might also change that quickly or they might be more static. Either way, since Salesforce is changing, um, sometimes that can impact any custom code that you put into your organization. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, we're not anti-code. We like code a lot. It's extremely powerful, um, but it can sometimes be inflexible and require revisions to keep it up to date. So by using third-party apps, you can actually reduce your long-term costs for your organization and ideally be able to make modifications to your processes without being able to bring in a consultant or a developer for help. Um, so you might have already figured this out, but not all apps are created equally. So as Salesforce consultants, we look for apps that kind of meet these criteria. We want, I, in, in most cases, apps that are native to Salesforce, which means the app lives inside of Salesforce and you don't have to learn another interface, or remember another password, or worry that your data is being routed or passed through some unsafe server. Um, whenever possible, we look for app developers who have expertise in our fields of nonprofits. So um, we found that developers who focus on nonprofits and program management kind of go about things differently. So we look for people who, who build in that way. Uh, cost, no one wants to pay a lot for apps, but we expect a lot from them. So <laughs> while we do take cost into consideration, what we're really looking at is the appropriate cost versus the function. If it's doing a lot, maybe it's worth paying a little bit more for and, and you know, vice versa. Um, and again, we do like those native apps because they often are more flexible and they allow us to do some customization and even add on automations that can help to streamline the business processes. Um, documentation and support. This one is huge uh, because you'd want to make sure that the app providers are not just helping you install the app, but ideally they should be helping you use the app to its highest potential and answer any questions that you might have. And then finally, around choosing apps, I just want to point out that, you know, we at Mowgli do not receive kickbacks or compensation for our recommendations. We only recommend apps that we've researched and tested and we feel are the best solution. So, whew. <laughs> uh, now you know how we evaluate all these apps, but you might be still wondering, you know, why do we choose the ones that we are specifically looking at for, for Bridges to Prosperity? Um, so the two main things that we were looking for were offline and low connection functionality and apps that have a high level of internal visibility. Um, for many of our clients, just like Bridges, work is not always done in a location where Wi-Fi or 3G connectivity is available. So that means that the tools we implement have to be usable offline, and TerraWorks and Mowgli fall into that bucket. Um, Taskray, on the other hand, is more predominantly in the visibility bucket. So now I just wanna walk a little bit deeper into to each app, and we can talk about the specifics of it. Uh, TerraWorks, so you're on the TerraWorks webinar. I'm assuming that most of you know what TerraWorks is, but it is an offline data collection tool. Um, it allows you to collect a ton of different types of data from just uh, straight text or pick list variables to GPS coordinates and images and even signatures and whatnot, and then sync those things seamlessly into Salesforce where they, you can then manipulate them inside the database. Um, we have evaluated a lot of offline data collection apps, and at one point we even had our own app on the App Exchange, a light version of this, but TerraWorks has consistently been the most reliable and the most flexible option that we've worked with. Um, their support team and documentation are a shining example of what to look for in an app provider, uh, and they're consistently updating their app and working hard to make sure that all their clients are using it as fully as possible by doing things like putting on these webinars. So you can see that it checks a lot of the boxes that we're looking for. Uh, another solution that we've found works well in those low connection areas is SMS. It is surprising how many people who don't even have running water may have a cell phone and are able to text. Um, Mowgli SMS is an app that our company Mowgli built and supports and Bridges uses it mainly to collect data from the public in those low connection areas. We developed Mowgli in um, 2012 to help Nuru International, another nonprofit, communicate with rural Kenyan farmers. Um, using the Mowgli SMS chatbots, farmers were able to receive personalized information about how to care for and protect their crops from 
disease and, and other dangerous things. So since then, Mowgli's gone through many iterations and it's being used in a ton more use cases, but this original use case still remains at the heart of the app and it's actually why we recommended it to Bridges to Prosperity. Um, so again, Bridges is using the app to communicate in real time with individuals around the world, um, lead them through a series of relevant questions that change based on their responses and then capture those responses directly back into Salesforce in a reportable way. Um, and so that means that gathering feedback on the impact of a bridge no longer has to require a trip to the community uh, and also help for community members is easily available. It's only a text message away. So there are a few other SMS apps available on Salesforce right now, but we have designed Mowgli to check the box on our list of good app requirements as well. So um, it's native, sits inside of Salesforce and it has uh, a lot of full features which you can read. Um, one of the most popular features is this branching surveys, which means that Mobley can respond intelligently based on the SMS responses that, um, that are sent in and can mimic having an actual conversation automatically. It's also really easy to set up these conversation streams. You don't have to be a developer or an admin to set those up. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is just that Mobley works in low connection areas, but more than that, it's actually available worldwide. So, Bridges Prosperity is using it in Rwanda, where it's very difficult to get a local number, um, but we have the ability to, to help them do that with this tool. All right, so the third tool in the suite um, is TaskRay, and this is a customizable program management, project management tool. Uh, as you can imagine, and as Abby kind of illustrated, managing teams on the ground from across the globe is no small endeavor. And you really want your teams to be able to know exactly what the next step is, who needs to accomplish it, what's the deadline. And as a manager, you wanna know where people are in the process at any given time. So Salesforce tasks are uh, an innate tool and they're great for personal to-do lists, but for scalable tasks with multiple levels of dependencies, it, it can fall short. And so this is why we frequently recommend TaskRay for personal and collaborative task and project management within Salesforce. So on this slide, you can see that TaskRay allows you to see your projects and your tasks in a ton of multiple and user-friendly views. You can create project and task templates and they can be easily reused and you can allow tasks to be linked to each other to form dependencies. Um, and that's pretty easy to do using um, native declarative processes that Salesforce offers like process folder and visual workflow. So we actually did this um, for Bridges to Prosperity um, and we created some automations using TaskRay around hiding task groups until a specific a uh, milestone is reached or a task is completed. So the whole point is being able to slim down a huge list of tasks that a staff member sees, uh, theoretically allowed that program manager to keep staff from feeling overwhelmed by the number of tasks, inadvertently completing or checking out the wrong task at the wrong time, and uh, hopefully keeping staff focused. So with all that said, um, since task rate isn't yet available offline, it doesn't fit all of the needs for the Bridges Prosperity field staff, but it does fit some of them, and we still recommend it for that reason. Okay, so in a moment, Abby is going to walk you through uh, examples of all of these apps working together inside of Salesforce. But before she does, I just want to highlight one more really important thing, which is that no matter what solutions you choose, whether they're apps or code or unicorns or whatever it happens to be, it is really vital, vital to get organization leadership on board for any of these new processes. Um, Bridges to Prosperity is a great example of a team that not only is not only tenacious in what they do, but they actually use and evaluate and refine their systems all the time, continuously. And they're looking for new ways to streamline their operations and to work smarter and not harder. And that evaluation process of what they're doing is super important, just as important as getting everybody on the same page and working together. So with that, I will hand it back to Abby and she can walk you through how everything works together inside of Salesforce. Abby, before you get started, I'm going to jump in with a question for you, Serena, from yeah. Maureen. Uh, yeah, um, we have a question from Maureen Nyachawa. So um, you just went through a couple apps here. Do these apps come as one package or do you get them separately? So like just the data collection app, not the SMS survey app or the other way around, et cetera. That is a really good question. They are all available individually. So they don't come as a specific suite or package. I know I might've been confusing when I said that. I'm just talking about the ones that we chose all working together. 
So um, it's both, uh, it's, it's a cool thing where you can kind of pick and choose what you need. And these are three individual apps that we've found to work great together and in this type of situation. I would also add, Maureen, that um, I think this is one of the benefits of the Salesforce platform is because they have such a robust app exchange, which is their marketplace of apps. So you can really customize um, the system with the exact things you need. So maybe you want to add on like um, a financial system or marketing automation. Like they ha have just thousands of apps that you can sort of customize. So these are all um, these are just examples of three that um, are meeting Bridges needs. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks, Serena. So let me switch this back to you, Abby. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, Serena. Um, and I think that that's actually a really good point. Um, we actually started this process by looking at building this entire system custom. Um, and the bids that we got to essentially have the same functionality that we have now, um, perhaps less actually compared to when we first got started, um, we were looking at between um, $150,000 and $400,000, um, which was just not in the cards for our organization. And I imagine not in the cards for most nonprofit organizations, especially if you're first getting started. Um, and so what was really exciting about this is that it allowed us to take really affordable off the shelf applications and stitch them together into a system um, that essentially maintains itself. Um, you know, so we have to we have to make sure that we're getting good data into our system. We have to make sure that we're providing training and good support to our staff. Um, but I'm never actually having to um, update systems to keep up with technology. And that was really, really important to us. Um, so I think it's helpful just to see what this looks like. And this is really just scratching the surface. Um, but it, when we have time for questions and answers, I'm happy to um, kind of fill you in on what the rest of the background looks like. Um, but that uh, schematic that we showed earlier and that Serena showed earlier um, showed the bridge record as kind of the central piece um, of our system. And, and that's what this looks like in the actual system itself. So we use the opportunity object, if you're familiar with Salesforce, for bridge records. Um, and this is a bridge record. Um, you can see that it's got, um, this is only a, a screenshot of a, a part of it. We have a ton of data that we store in a single bridge record. But you can see here um, what the, uh, what, essentially what a bridge record looks like. And then if you were to scroll, you would be able to see pre and post construction photos, links to photo albums, um, externally GPS coordinates and then also the ability to pop that open and view that bridge in Google Maps. Um, some external um, stats that we pull into Salesforce from the WorldPop database, an approval history here um, uh, that's, that's bouncing back and forth between field and headquarters. And then we still use Box as our online um, file storage and management system. Um, but each uh, box folder is actually connected directly to a bridge record. Um, so it makes navigation and file storage really easy. Um, so you can see if we were to scroll back up, um, we use campaigns to both um, to track our donor and donation records here. So you can see that this particular campaign on the Manigo Bridge in Rwanda, um, Balfour Beatty Major Projects and Mont McDonald, both engineering construction firms that traveled um, to help us complete the superstructure and also sponsored this project this year. Um, you can also see there's task gray. Um, so I could pop this entire project open and you could see all the tasks associated with getting this project um, surveyed, approved, built, um, and then eventually inspected and maintained. Um, but you can see those projects are um, really displayed on the bridge record itself. And then there's, um, there's TerraWorks. So that's the project assessment that was associated with this particular bridge. Um, our field staff are able to um, go out to visit a new site for the very first time. And with a project assessment, once they sync that with TerraWorks, um, it both creates this bridge record in the system and then attaches all of the data that was associated um, with that bridge um, in the form of a project assessment. And all of that data can be aggregated in the form of a report. And then finally, there's Mowgli. So that's how Mowgli manifests itself on a bridge record. Um, from this particular bridge record, I can pop open 
um, that campaign and see all of the people that have participated in surveys um, associated with this bridge, including what their access looks like before and after. And that's one of the ways that we monitor impact on bridges and also um, generally assess um, how communities are interacting with bridges um, following construction. And so it's really important to have all that data um, available on a particular bridge record, um, but it's also really important to be able to see a, a high level and aggregate that information, something we really were not able to do um, before last year. And so you can see this is just one program country, um, but all of this data um, as it is being updated by um, field staff in Rwanda um, is displayed on this dashboard here right in Salesforce. And this is just a, a native Salesforce tool um, that allows you to see, um, in our particular case, um, how many bridges at any given time are in prospecting, have been completed this year, um, how, how we're doing against our goal for the fiscal year. Um, and then right now we're also conducting um, or rather refining a Rwanda needs assessment. And so we're also using TerraWorks for this process. And I can pop in here at any given time and see how many sites have been assessed, um, how each assessor is doing, um, what the results of those are in terms of um, if it's a, a site that's appropriate to build or not. And then, like I mentioned before, this is also connected to our development program. So we have thousands and thousands of donor records also in the system. Um, and here you can just see a quick snapshot of our industry program um, in which people uh, sponsor projects um, and are able to help us complete the superstructure on those projects. And then you can see an overall view of the teams that have traveled with us this year, where they went, how many people were there, the stage of the bridge, um, et cetera, all in one place. And then of course, um, at a, on a global level, being able to see how you're doing against goals, um, how you're, you're progressing against your, um, the, the problem that you've identified overall, this is really, really huge for us. Um, and so this is just um, a tiny screenshot from a giant dashboard um, that tells us how we're doing across the globe and you can see here that uh, at the time I took the screenshot last week we completed 277 bridges that served just over a million people um, and then to date at that time we had identified um, more than a thousand sites um, that would serve um, an additional 1,700,000 people and so this has really been a game changer for our organization in terms of how we make decisions. Um, and what's really exciting about this is that this isn't something that I just have access here at, um, at our headquarters in Denver. This is something um, that every person in the organization has access to. And not the thing that's been really exciting about this is when you make data available um, in forms like this, um, it really empowers um, staff all over the world at all levels to make decisions and, and generate ideas about how we can work better and more efficiently. And there's just a quick screenshot of um, a more recent project and how that manifests itself um, in Taskray. So switching from that um, very simple Gantt chart that I showed earlier to um, a, a, a Gantt chart that is really important to our organization as a construction organization. Um, ultimately, and allows us to coordinate really complicated tasks um, from multiple locations. And with that, I think we can um, kick it to questions. Great. Thanks, Abby. This is, yeah, super impressive and so great to see all of this work and uh, what you're able to get out of it. Um, one thing that hopped out at me on one of the um, previous slides actually that you mentioned before was that kind of crossing that million dollars or the million people impacted mark um, and how kind of these reports are actually functioning as um, kind of morale boosters and um, yeah getting people pumped up in, about meeting milestones and stuff so I thought that was a good story you want to share that one yeah, um, so in the in the past, um, we really only um, aggregated information like that on an annual basis. 
Um, and even then, um, it, the the way that we did it was kind of a cumbersome process and it generally was only shared at headquarters just because we're a small team we're all very busy and it's difficult to do um, and because all of this um, essentially as people are completing projects and updating um, the, the work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis everyone is able to see that and so um, you know previously I would have you know, maybe worked with a couple of folks on our development team and let them know that this was a milestone that we were approaching. And in this case, I didn't do a thing. Um, our uh, manager of marketing um, checks that dashboard, um, I think at least once a week, saw that it was upcoming and was able to plan a marketing campaign around it without me um, saying a thing. And, and, and that's really, um, it's a small thing, but it was a huge milestone for our organization. And I think what is more, um, what's more interesting about that is just the transparency of it. So it's not even that she could just see that we were approaching 1 million people. She could see um, everything that got us to that point um, and, and all of the data and information that aggregates us to that point. Um, you know, and even going into um, the last few bridges that we built that got us um, over that milestone and, and looking at photos and looking at the community stories that were coming in from our tarot works forms. Um, and that's, that's really exciting and empowering, I think. Great. Thanks. It's a great story. Um, I have a question because you showed that photo of the, the paper forms um, and you mentioned that paper was fine up to a point. And I hear that a lot too, um, especially with kind of smaller organizations. It's totally fine to manage by paper. What At what point do you think it's time to centralize and digitize, um, either generally or, or for Bridges specifically? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I think we waited too long. <laughs> I, will, I will say that. Um, but I think um, for sure, if you have plans to scale, um, you know, right now we're exploring um, we, we build about uh, 40 bridges a year. We are actively investing in getting to a point where we can build hundreds of bridges a year. Um, and when we saw that coming or when we, you know, essentially created a strategic plan um, that would get us to that point, um, this was part of that for sure. Um, I think that, you know, once we had a staff that was bigger than a few people at headquarters and a few people in a program country, that is when we started to really feel the burn of paper, right? Because if you've just got a couple of people, um, everybody knows each other really well. And if I'm missing information or, um, you know, if there's an engineer in Denver that needs survey data, um, he personally knows the engineer in Nicaragua or Rwanda and can just send him a WhatsApp and say, hey, um, where's that survey? I need it right away, otherwise I'm not gonna be able to get you um, your design approved. Um, and when you start to grow and not everybody knows one another or has that relationship, um, you need to put some systems in place. Um, and it doesn't work anymore to have really valuable, important data bouncing around in a binder in the back of somebody's pickup truck. Um, and, and the other thing is that um, when you start to look back to make decisions, I think that that is where being able to aggregate and look back at historical data is really important um, for us, especially because we do infrastructure, right? And so um, Serena right now is helping us build um, a really complicated inspection form um, in TerraWorks. Elaine, you should take a peek at it if you haven't already, because it's really a work of art and magic. <laughs> it's really complicated, um, but we need to be able to, um, we, we conduct inspections on a regular cadence um, across all of our, our bridges. Uh, being able to plug all that into a spreadsheet, not a big deal for 50 bridges. Um, it's a huge deal when you're talking about hundreds of projects that have um, a, a, a you know minimum useful um, life of 30 to 40 years um, and you're inspecting them and partnering with local governments on maintenance and repairs. Um, that gets really, really complicated um, and paper forms just do not allow you to make 
um, good decisions <laughs> on, a, on a global scale about how you're operating your inspection and maintenance programs. Um, or really pull data like, you know, if, if we're able to see that in a particular country, for example, um, we're consistently seeing suspenders um, degrade before they, they should. Um, that would tell us, right, that our steel supplier in that particular country um, isn't, um, isn't up to snuff. Um, and those are the types of decisions that aggregating that information automatically allows you to make. And just to echo that, Abby, I think um, you've totally nailed it in our experience um, doing these types of implementations for uh, nonprofits in, in various industries. Really, the data-driven decision-making is the big piece, and it's a piece that folks often don't realize that they're missing until they have it, um, because like you guys, they're doing, you know, uh, they're looking at their data on an infrequent basis once a year, maybe maybe more frequent twice a year, maybe once a quarter, but but it's not real time and available to them all the time. And so they can't see um, those those patterns emerging as quickly and it takes a lot longer for them to iterate. And so once they have that data um, available, we see a lot of people saying, oh my gosh, I didn't even know what I was missing. I didn't even realize that this was something that was possible. And so it's kind of a catch-22 because you can go a long time in that way and function just fine. And sometimes we even tell people, you know, paper works. In some situations, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. But once you hit that scalable point, like you said, Abby, you'd be surprised in how much more than just scalability you gain out of, out of moving to an integrated system. For sure. And, and I will say that uh, we have been really lucky in, in that our staff have been pretty responsive to uptake. Um, we rolled this out to a global staff of around, um, at this point, 60 people who are using this on a regular basis. And I think part of what really helped um, is that I, I was, um, I was really flexible in how we rolled this out, right? So when we, we first um, deployed this system, um, and, and actually through, through today, um, if people prefer to say collect field data, um, you know, on paper, that's fine. Um, and the system has the flexibility built in so that if you don't want to use the mobile form, um, you can collect it on paper and then enter it directly into Salesforce later. Um, the only rule is that it has to get into Salesforce at some point. Um, and, and I would say that the huge majority of people prefer the mobile form, um, you know, for example, but building in flexibility like that really helps to um, encourage update, uptake and ownership um, in the field. That's a really good tip. I want to get into the adoption um, a little bit more, but I do have a question from Lorena kind of on the opposite spectrum of this scaling question. So her question is, how do you make pilots now that you have a whole system? Do you still pilot with pen and paper or do you pilot straight within the apps? Um, and she's talking about implementing a whole new process or a system. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we actually, um, you know, like I said, we haven't been doing this that long. Um, we've really only rolled this out in the last year. But uh, as part of our uh, needs assessment, uh, um, refinement Rwanda. So we did a needs assessment in Rwanda um, several years ago, and we're, we're going back and collecting more data on all of those sites um, because we are, are actively scaling in that country, and so we need to know a little bit more about um, each one of those potential bridge sites. And, and that was a, a question that, um, that really we hadn't had to tackle until we started the, the scaling process in Rwanda. Um, and we ended up building a form on the fly. This was actually just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we did it exclusively in TerraWorks. Um, Mowgli, um, Serena helped us put that together. And we um, both tested it and rolled it out within two weeks um, in the field. And, and it actually worked really well. And I think that in part, it, it worked well because we had already been in the system. Um, you know, six months ago, I might have tried it on paper first, but now people are used to it. The people that were going to be testing it were already accustomed to TerraWorks, and so I think it would have been um, felt like a, a step backwards to uh, start it on paper. And it actually is currently the only form that we don't have on paper. 
And I'll just add to that that you know once you get your systems honed in um, in their initial use case, it's usually not that difficult for you or whoever helped you implement to you know do things just like Abby was saying, spin up something new, um, do an addition, and and work within the apps that you already have working for you. That's what we want in apps that you use um, is that flexibility, so that ideally it should be just as easy for you to. Um, do something on paper as to put it into the system and, and let people use it um, using the technologies that you let they thrown into the field. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, going back to adoption. Um, so, Abby, you kind of listed out all the different roles that are coordinating together to make a project successful, and there are quite a few of them. How did you get them all on board with? Um, kind of moving to the system and coordinating with each other. Yeah, um, so when we first rolled the system out, um, I, I did a training with all of our program managers and our senior field staff um, that was a multi-day over, I think, I think a two-week period. Um, so everybody was really busy. This was a huge ask. I think in total we were looking at um, four to six hours of of training and um, the the way that I approached it and I think it actually ended up working really well was I kind of gamified it um, so people um, participated and I, and I walked them through um, basically how to do everything new you know what the foundation of the system was um, almost nobody that participated in the training had ever even seen Salesforce just a couple people on the development team were familiar with it um, certainly nobody um, was familiar with how um, our particular use case, um, which is, is kind of unique, looked within Salesforce. And so um, about half of the training was um, just me talking and, and clicking through screenshots and sharing my screen in the system and kind of walking people through it. And the other half um, was assignments. And um, each of those essentially had a, um, a, a point or like a, a system of points associated with it. And so, um, you know, for example, people had to make fake project assessments and chatter me on them. They had to use TerraWorks. They had to create new fake bridge records, um, new reports, new dashboards. And um, if they did it within the, the time allotted, they got points and then there were prizes at the end for the people that got the most points. Um, and, and I think that that really helped. It actually wasn't a big deal to put together. I also had some silly quizzes up on SurveyMonkey, um, and people got really competitive about it. <laughs> there were a ton of prizes. Um, they weren't expensive, but they were good. You know, so we're talking about like fifty to seventy-five dollar gift certificates to REI and things like that. Um, and and the uptake was really good um, in the end. And we we've, we've continued to use that approach. Um, and then the other thing is that we set up formal opportunities for feedback. Um, and have, I think, been really responsive to them. And so, you know, if, if somebody feels frustrated by something or they don't understand something, I think it's really important to make sure you have office hours or a formal process um, by which people can provide feedback so they, they feel heard. Um, I get to the field whenever I can, but mostly I am sitting at a desk in Denver. And so um, it is really impossible for me to understand um, you know, what the user experience is like on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's really important for me to listen um, and not just wait for someone to be a squeaky whale, but really to introduce and invite and be responsive to that feedback. Those are great tips. I have heard kind of gamifying trainings um, have been very successful. It really gets people engaged and in, in interacting with the system. So um, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question here from Priscilla. What challenges do you face, if any, with data entry accuracy? And how do you validate data entered into your system? <laughs> that is a really good question. Um, we, we have a lot of challenges with it. Um, uh, there is, you know, all, all of your reports and all of your decision making, um, they, they don't mean anything if the data going into the system is bad. Um, and so, one of the things um, that I've done is make sure that the people that um, have the, the expertise 
to review data are the ones that are actually reviewing data. And so, for example, um, we take a lot of, of technical survey data, right? And so, um, I one of the first things that I did was set up a dashboard for our lead engineer um, and then all of our field engineers so that as technical data is coming in, they are able to see that in aggregate. And then I also set up a couple of reports that were um, that are essentially uh, intended to reveal problems, right? So um, I have reports and, um, and particular dashboards that um, reveal gaps in data, that reveal anomalies in data, right? Um, so, you know, bridge spans that are, um, you know, exceed 200 meters or, um, you know, really important data fields and forms um, if, you know, more than 5% of them in a, in a data set are blank. Um, and you can set all of those up automatically. And so I conduct data audits on a quarterly basis where I kind of systematically go through those reports, but then I also have dashboards that are set up um, that I can glance at every once in a while. And you only, that really only becomes helpful if if you're familiar with the data in the first place um, and it was it was helpful that i was going into it um, because you know what to look for and you know what you've consistently seen but once you have those reports up and running um, it, it's really easy to see where you know maybe a certain person or a certain um, group of people are confused by a question and so answering it very differently from um, people in other program countries. Um, and then that might reveal, you know, for example, in your form, um, you need to, you know, provide some help text or some clarification that is locally appropriate. Um, and, and so I, I would say that it's an active process for sure, um, but a lot more, um, you can automate it um, if you put some work in to you know, setting up reports and dashboards that are um, intentionally seeking <laughs> to reveal bad data or inconsistent data um, at the outset. Yeah, and I think you know once those things are identified, like Abby is talking about, um, sometimes you can put into place uh, internal validations inside TerraWorks forms or inside Salesforce itself to um, prevent people from from entering as bad of data at least. Um, within specific fields. So whether it's making you know, it a pick list of only specific things that you can choose or adding limitations or, or validating the format of an answer, um, de depending on what you're validating for, those things are options as well. That's a really good point. And actually, um, the simplest way that manifests itself for us is GPS coordinates. Um, so for bridge sites or for locations near bridge sites, like hospitals or schools that we need to track. Um, if you ask 10 different people in 10 different countries um, how to write out GPS coordinates, they will give you 10 different answers. And that's really hard for making a map or, or having it manifest itself in any kind of visual form. Um, and so what we did is both in Salesforce and in TerraWorks, um, you know, we did a standard format for GPS coordinates and that's the only way that you can enter them. And as a, as a result, we have, um, completely eliminated the, the problem of our bridge maps and our identified site maps showing, you know, places in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean <laughs> where climate change is needed. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I would say that um, those are really great and oftentimes these things all kind of work together. So um, we've seen a lot of people create these types of reports that um, are especially used to see what kind of, um, issues are coming in with the data and then they'll add that into um, the TerraWorks validations so that you avoid those things coming in and then you keep monitoring the reports for other things and so those things kind of work together so that you get better and better data over time as you are understanding um, the frequent types of errors that are coming in. Um, great, so then I think we're about at time. I had one final question to wrap things up which is, um, Based on your insights from building out this system, what advice would you give people who are planning to implement a comprehensive system like this? Um, or yeah, along the lines of like these best practices, if you could do things over, what would you have changed? 
Um, you know, I don't, this actually ended up working out uh, better than I even expected. Um, you know, we went from being almost entirely analog to being almost entirely digital inside of a year. And that's, that felt like a pretty big accomplishment and frankly, not something that I thought we could do. Um, I would say that the, the piece of that that was most important was the leadership at our organization was incredibly supportive of this. Um, and we dedicated resource to it. Um, so we really didn't spend a ton of money on the system. Um, we, we spent um, a, absolutely a fraction of what we were quoted to build out a custom system. Um, but we did have time. Um, so I was able to dedicate a lot of time to this at the outset um, and was, was able to have ownership over it. And as I've talked to other folks at other organizations, um, it's really common at nonprofits. I mean, more it's it's almost unheard of for people to not wear multiple hats and have um, multiple responsibilities. And while that is certainly the case um, for my department at my organization and, and my position, um, at the outset of this, I had um, a lot of support from um, leadership and the rest of our staff to dedicate time to this. It wasn't just a small um, a small thing that was temporary, right? Like this is an ongoing piece of my job. And, and I've talked to a lot of people who have been tasked with doing something like this as a temporary project, right? Like so research and get something like, you know, a, a, an integrated system or a mobile data collection system or a survey system online and then go back to your regular job. Um, and that, that just doesn't work. Um, you, you need to be able to have somebody who is at least dedicated to this on a part-time basis um, in perpetuity. And, and that's really important. I would absolutely agree with that from the consultant side, just having somebody who's the champion for, for the system inside and who really understands the data and the process and can get feedback more easily from the team and really just be that kind of go-between helps um, whoever is building out your system or helping you to build it out to do it more effectively and faster and more efficiently. And so um, we always really encourage uh, our clients to, to have somebody on the ground, just like Abby's saying, who um, is kind of holding the space for, for it and, and being kind of that point of contact internally at minimum. Great. Well, we're at time. So thank you so much, Abby and Serena, for sharing your insights and your experiences with this. This is just awesome to see um, and great work to Bridges to Prosperity. We, we love what you do. So keep it up. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.